Welcome. Thank you so much for joining us, uh, live audience. And also, we have a streaming audience as well. And of course, it'll be in perpetuity on YouTube somewhere. So that's uh, all good stuff. Really an honor to uh, have Inna Sovson join us here at Berkeley. Uh, Inna was a visiting scholar at our center some time back as a Fulbright scholar. Uh, but uh, before that, she was the Deputy uh, Minister for Education and Science at of Ukraine. Um, and uh, since then, after going back to uh, Ukraine, after being with us in 2014 and 2016, roughly, oh no, I'm sorry, I got the, the date wrong. Uh, that was 2019 when you were here with us at Berkeley. She is now a member of parliament, um, the RADA uh, in Ukraine. And uh, uh, I should note that she's also currently a lecturer at uh, Kiev School, uh, School of Economics uh, and is uh, intimately knowledgeable about all things Ukrainian, but also higher education. Uh, and she's also uh, been on many media outlets on uh, CNN, BBC, MS, NBC, and other outlet social media um, talking about uh, the uh, plight of Ukraine in the midst of this aggression from Russia and the war. So I want to note, um, I'm John Douglas uh, here at the Center uh, for Studies in Higher Ed, and uh, this event is co-sponsored by the Institute of Slavic and East European and or Eurasian Studies and the Institute of European Studies, and I think the Goldman School of Public Policy, which the Center is part of, is also a co-sponsor. So uh, with that, uh, Inna is going to start us off with a uh, short PowerPoint presentation to talk and show, uh, to, uh, talk about uh, universities in Ukraine. Um, thank you very much. I think I'll start over there and then get back to my seat so that, uh, yeah, uh, so that I don't look up. Well, that phrase doesn't sound uh, funny after the movie. But um, yeah, so I did a little presentation uh, just to show uh, I think pictures matter, and I think seeing the reality of, of uh, education with your own eyes is, is important. Uh, so since the start of, of the full-scale invasion, and note here in brackets that the actual war started in 2014, so that was over eight years ago, that uh, I will be mostly focusing on, on events after February 24th. Uh, since then, as of today, um, during Russian war against Ukraine, uh, 2,739 educational institutions have been destroyed or damaged. Um, 333 of them are completely destroyed. That's not just universities, that would also include kindergartens and, and schools um, and all of that, but, uh, um, uh, but still uh, that is a quite significant uh, number. Um, and and uh, one, as if we speak about colleges and universities, that the number is about 147 that were destroyed or damaged under Russian attacks. Uh, one might think that majority of those institutions that have been damaged or destroyed are on the east or on the south of Ukraine, but the reality is that it, it's it's much more complicated than that. We do have uh, schools uh, destroyed in, in central Ukraine as the result of the bomb attacks, uh, of the missile strikes. Uh, we do have um, some institutions, um, uh, the universities in Chernihiv, which is north of Kiev, uh, that is uh, the city that has been under siege. It was never completely captured by Russians, but it was very much under siege. Uh, they have many universities destroyed over there on the north of the country. So, so it's uh, it's not just the east and the south of the country. It's actually also part of the uh, part of the um, buildings, uh, university buildings in in other parts of of Ukraine. Uh, one uh, interesting comment in that direction is that um, most recent attacks on energy infrastructure in Kiev that you all have seen, uh, when they started, they they also targeted some buildings in the Kyiv city center. Um, and that actually is the result of one of those attacks in Kyiv city center in October this year. Um, they have damaged the building of Kyiv National University. And the department that was mostly damaged was the Department for Russian Linguistics. There is a sad irony over there, I guess. Um, but uh, I think they're about to shut it down, but, but that's actually an interesting comment on that. So uh, here I'll just show you some of the pictures. This is from uh, Karazan Kharkiv National University. This is one of the best universities in the country. It's top five universities in the country altogether. 
and of course with Kharkiv being under constant uh, shelling by by Russians it, it's it's my native city so I, I feel a lot for, for Kharkiv uh, I didn't go to university there but uh, yeah, this is what it looks like. This is what the the buildings look like uh, in Kharkiv, uh, in in one of the biggest universities uh, uh, in the country. Uh, here is a small note that, um, uh, of course, I did mention that institutions in all parts of the country have been destroyed, but particularly in Donetsk and Luhansk region, that is where we get the the, the enormous number of institutions that have been uh, destroyed uh, in the region. That the data you can see uh, over here, but also the same for Kharkiv. Right, uh, and in Kharkiv, it's, it's schools, but also university buildings. Kharkiv is, is a huge university center, and, and they got quite a significant number of, of uh, institutions destroyed over there. Um, that is uh, a university in Irpin, actually. Uh, Irpin, you all know of, uh, they do have a big uh, state fiscal service uh, university, um, which was very well kept. People in, in fiscal service got the money to support their own university. But you can see what happened there. And that is uh, in Mariupol, uh, which, of course, is, is the most damaged city out of all. And uh, we don't have access to that. So that is, uh, uh, yeah, so to the best of our knowledge, that is what it looks like uh, right now. Uh, then there are some schools, which you can also see here. Uh, there is school in Hulaipola, which is in Zaporizhia region, south of Ukraine, and uh, schools in Kramatorsk, uh, which is the Donetsk region on the east of the country. Um, yeah, you can see to what extent they are destroyed. Uh, um, sh should note over here, um, and I was not asked to do this, but but there is a, a Ukrainian a Berkeley club which was most recently established, and they are actually now fundraising to help rebuild schools in Ukraine, uh, specifically schools not universities. But uh, I think that people here in Berkeley care about education very much, and I think that's a very right audience to target. So in case you're willing to help with that, every five dollars matter in that sense. So feel free to get in touch with the uh, Ukrainian club of Berkeley and. Uh, share this information that they, they really need lots of um, lots of uh, money to rebuild those. Um, this again, some universities are in, uh, that's in Mykolaiv, uh, a city on the south, on the on the Black Sea. Uh, uh, and uh, yeah, they've been damaged in Mykolaiv and shelling it pretty heavily. It's not as much as Harkiv, but still quite significantly. Yeah, you can see what happened to university over there. Uh, this is uh, Skovarada National Pedagogic University in Kharkiv, again, uh, one of the biggest centers training teachers in Kharkiv. Um, it's one of their buildings. Um, uh, there, there would be multiple more pictures like this from, from other universities all over the country. But just to give you the snapshot that, that those uh, uh, damages to infrastructure are very real and, and, and some of them are very bad and some of them are destroyed beyond uh, beyond reconstruction, they will just have to build them back from scratch. Some of them can be repaired one way or another. Yeah. Um, so that is uh, the reality. Uh, but then apart from, from the institutions that have been damaged or destroyed, there is another problem. And that is with the institutions uh, that are under occupied territories. Uh, and that is a, a different problem over here. So uh, starting from, um, uh, from from the beginning of the big war, from from February 2000, uh, 2022, um, 43 universities from four regions that have been occupied, recently occupied by Russia, have been moved to other regions of uh, Ukraine. Um, the, the number is, however, slightly confusing because um, the reality is that, uh, in fact, out of the, those 43 universities, they were moved. So what does that mean? What does that entail? So it means that um, they have taken the university administration um, and the, the archives, the documents, all of that. So, so it's more of a formal mover to make sure that they have at least access to all the information, their databases and all of that. But this does not mean that all uh, teaching staff has moved. It doesn't mean that all students have moved. It just means that uh, there are more... Uh, yeah, it just means that technically, legally, the institution is located on the control territory. But the issue is uh, that we don't know like the real situation as to the exact number of uh, of uh, teaching staff. Like because te you know university professors they are all over the place. Some of them actually stayed under occupied territory uh, because they couldn't move because they have elderly parents to take care of. 
some moved to the control territory, some moved abroad. It's 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 very diverse, and the same goes for for students as well. You know, uh, so so this is a very uh, very diverse picture, and and the reality is that those institutions they they restarted education and they restarted uh, instruction online, of course, um, but now the issue would be how to uh, to move back. Like right now, if if you are following the news, uh, we are doing that very closely right now. Those minutes, literally, uh, if Russia really liberates Kherson, if they indeed go away from the city, that will mean the universities will have to move back in. That sounds great, right? But then comes another problem. And another problem is, but what about those uh, professors who stayed in Kherson and they worked with the occupying authorities? That will be another level of problem that we'll have to deal with. There will be, you know, we'll have, first we'll have to collect that information that we'll have to know, like, were they forced to do so? Or did they do it because those were their beliefs? And, and that's another like huge separate issue. Like how do you deal with those who collaborated with the occupying authorities? Because there was uh, Kherson National University. There was the one that relocated, but then the Russians authorities also opened Kherson National University under Russian Federation. And, and typically the people who said that they're teaching there are the teachers from the same, the same university. So the issue is what do you do with those people? And that, that's going to be a huge, huge problem for all of us. Um, and then uh, there is another issue to this uh, debate uh, um, with the professors. Um, you know, many people have left uh, the country, but those who left are women. Men are not allowed to leave the country during the wartime because they are obligated to serve, which is a complicated issue from the feminist perspective. I can, uh, trust me, I am aware of all the debates, but the situation, it is what it is right now, right? We can't do much during the wartime about changing this. Uh, but so, so many women left, particularly those that have small kids, they needed to take care of them. That, that's quite legitimate, right? But we are still uh, facing the issue with, uh, will they come back? Uh, and that's a big issue. I mean, some of those, particularly those whose husbands um, or parents, dads of their kids stayed in Ukraine, they will most likely move back. But again, it's no guarantee. And we might be facing a huge brain drain uh, for, for the whole university system. And it's very gender unbalanced for obvious reasons. Uh, but in terms of, of men working in the universities, uh, many of them actually ended up serving in the army. And, and here I want to show you a picture of, uh, of this a uh, professor, uh, head of the sociology department in the University of Uzhorod. Uzhorod is the, the most western city of Ukraine. It's actually like, like 30 kilometers to, 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 to Slovakia and Hungary border. Uh, he never served before, but he got into the army when the war started. Uh, and uh, yeah, he's now, uh, like, he served in the Zoom area. I'm not sure where he is right now because the Zoom has been liberated. But if you look at the picture, uh, you know what he's doing over there? He's actually teaching a class. Mm -hmm. He is teaching a class from, uh, yeah, so he has his phone, he has his notes, uh, and he's teaching a class uh, for his students who are in all over the place, right? Because theoretically they would be in Ujhorod, but they're everywhere right now. Uh, yeah, I think that speaks to the resilience of the people. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm just amazed with the guy who decided to do it, so. And then there is another guy, this guy actually, no, he's a friend of mine. He is a great physicist and one of the biggest, most famous uh, bloggers uh, writing about science and science policy and all, all things scientific in Ukraine. His name is Anton Sananko. Um, and uh, and, and I, like, I didn't know what he was doing or something, but then suddenly, like two months into uh, the, the big war, I, I go on Facebook and I see that he's actually helping to evacuate, he has been helping to evacuate people from Bucha and Irpin from the first day of the big invasion, which is something I never expected him to do. He's like, he's like a nerd, like literally a nerd. And, 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 and I never believed, like Anton would be the last person to, I would think of who would do that. That is what he was doing. And, and uh, now of course, uh, Bucha and Irpin are liberated uh, for, for, for half a year, uh, but he's doing other stuff right now. He's actually, uh, moving his, uh, uh, he's helping to, to he's volunteering uh, and delivering stuff to the army on, on the front line right now. Uh, but that, okay, that's the st individual story of individual bravery, but there comes another issue. So to what extent he's able to proceed with his uh, research work, you know, to what extent the research institutions have actually lost uh, their, their, their research stuff because they're involved doing this. 
you know, uh, and that's that's another big problem. Uh, and then uh, should be wrapping up here. Um, so, so people ask me like, so so do you study? <laughs> is there studying going on? And as a matter of fact, uh, there is actually a majority of universities reopened for online classes by the end of March. And 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 I have a. Um, I have a, an assistant who's still do, she's finishing her master's degree. And, and of course, we were all busy with, with, you know, doing lots of work and all of that. And then she texted me and said, like, you know, they're reopening classes. Like, how do I go to classes when there is war and we are doing lots of work for war and all of that? It felt strange. But in a way, I could see the logic behind that because people needed at least some feeling of normality. Right. Uh, and uh, of course, it's still complicated because lots of students volunteer or they are in the army or anything like that. But uh, but they reopened universities um, for online learning. And then on September 1st, when the new school year started, uh, the universities are still mainly working online, even though there are some that started some classes, at least part of the teaching doing offline. Now uh, they can keep in Western Ukraine and schools have been uh, reopening as well. Um, the major issue being there is, is to have the bomb shelters. So, yeah. so while you are reviewing curriculum for, for the new school here, we were reviewing the bomb shelters and those are some of the bomb shelters in Tarashashanko National University uh, of Kiev. And that, that's a big issue. You need to have a bomb shelter where students would be able to go down in case of the air raid alert. Yeah, so, so those are some of the uh, bomb shelters that uh, you, oh, sorry. Um, yeah, that you can see around here. That, that's been a big issue over here uh, in Ukraine. And um, yeah, the, the same for schools, particularly for schools, because it's small kids, right? And uh, uh, I'm, I'm a mother myself. My son goes to fourth grade and uh, we had to choose whether to go to study online or offline. We chose for offline. Uh, which is frankly speaking after those attacks on energy infrastructure is basically the only option because you can't do online if you don't have electricity. That's another big problem. Um, yeah, but but uh, his school having a bomb shelter was one of the big factors in me feeling safe for him to go back to school. But many kids, uh, their schools don't have good bomb shelters. So again, if you ask me, I want to donate and to help uh, kids in Ukraine, what is the number one issue to do is, is donate, help uh, build a bomb shelter. That is the, the biggest issue for, for our kids over there. So, um, so okay, I, I took too long. I should uh, sit down uh, here and... Uh, no, that was really good and informative. Um, should I switch back to something? Oops. I just want to... Uh, so the format is that uh, I have some questions and we'll talk a bit with Anna. Uh, please think about questions you might want to ask in the audience and also online. We can look at the chat and see if we can get to a few. Well, let me start out with kind of a question before the war. What was the role of universities in Ukraine in terms of uh, developing a democracy there or an open society? And are there any kind of comments you want to make about what was good or bad about Ukrainian universities before the war? Um, yeah, thanks uh, for this question. Um, so, uh, you, you know me, we had lots of talks about that. And I'm, um, the truth is that I'm rather critical of Ukraine's uh, higher education. I, I recognize there are lots of issues. I'm not hiding away from them. I'm not saying that, you know, everything was perfect and, and, and all of that. I actually do believe that there were quite lots of problems because um, majority of universities, well, they reflect the state of the society altogether. And, and you do know the problems with corruption in Ukraine. Again, we shouldn't be hiding away from that. I'm, I'm not pretending it doesn't exist. It was the case for many universities as well, right? So that was the issue. Um, there were issues with, uh, you know, we, when I served in the Ministry of Education and Science, we did launch some of the reforms in Ukraine's higher education system with providing more autonomy to the Ukrainian universities, so with the, giving them more incentives to, to westernize um, and so on and so forth. But as you all know, universities are very conservative institutions here in Ukraine, everywhere. And um, I do think that uh, yeah, Ukrainian universities need lots of reforms and um, uh, including those for them to be promoters of democracy. That's uh, that's one of the one, one of the main issues of the of the missions of the university. Um, and there are some universities which are doing this very good. I'm proud to be a graduate of one of such institutions of Kiev Mohyla Academy, I'm still teaching there as well. Uh, but then there are some universities which are kind of Soviet-style institutions. And in the Soviet times, uh, that was very specific for, for, for the Soviet higher education uh, because 
during the Soviet times, they were so much afraid of, of the institutions uh, of higher learning being the centers of intellectual thought, and so on and so forth, that they actually split institutions into very, like, like smaller universities or institutes, they were called. Uh, so, we, and, and we still have a legacy of that. We still have a, a um, national university of food technologies. It's a separate institution that only deals with, you know, preparing people working in food industry which sounds slightly ridiculous to me, frankly speaking. Uh, our, all of our medical universities are separate institutions. Uh, they are not connected to classical universities and, and they are actually run by Ministry of Health, not by Ministry of Education. So they're outside of this, this whole debate and so on and so forth. And I do think, so, so, so this split of, of institution, that was the part of the Soviet model altogether. And I think that now, uh, as terrible as this war is, uh, uh, there can be actually an opening to, you know, to promote more reforms inside uh, Ukrainian universities, and they need to think about their mission. They need to think about, you know, what is the the optimal size of the institution, whether to merge, uh, particularly those who relocated and they will be moving back, and so on and so forth. So I, I'm trying to see some positive opportunities here in terms of, you know, institutions actually understanding what their mission is. Yeah, I would imagine that. Uh... Uh, becoming a member of the EU would be a really important component for any kind of rejuvenation of uh, higher education in Ukraine. Uh, another thing that you know, fact that you know, is that there are a tremendous number of refugees, Ukrainian refugees, some 5 million out throughout Europe and 3 million are in Poland. How are those, uh, how are those students being served or are they being served? I know that the Open University in the UK, for example, is offering scholarships and free online courses. Where, where's the EU in, in providing support for these refugees? Yeah, indeed, the EU is actually doing quite a lot for the students who left Ukraine. Uh, and it sounds good, but then it also creates some problems for two reasons. Uh, one, uh, the brain drain issue, right? So. I can imagine a student, uh, a female student, uh, you know, younger age, uh, she typically wouldn't have a family, right? I mean, she would have parents, but she's not having a husband, uh, children and all of that. Um, and she gets an opportunity to study in a university in Warsaw, living in the U EU. Like, what is the reason for her to go back to Ukraine? That, that's going to be a huge problem, huge one. Um, and, and we have uh, like like tens of thousands of students like this who left and, and who are now inside the EU. And, and uh, I'm just trying to figure out what would be the logic for them to go back home, you know. Uh, and then uh, another big problem here uh, is that, um, yeah, one is, is brain drain. And, and, and uh, the second one is that, yeah, the EU is so much focused on helping those who are inside the EU. That it forgets that actually those who are inside Ukraine actually need more help and more support because they need they're actually in much more dire circumstances uh, and and I think that is uh, one of the issues to uh, to remember as well right uh, particularly those uh, from Kharkiv or anywhere else so that they're in terrible situations and they, they really need much more help than those inside the EU but in terms of uh, how do I see the future for that again I'm trying to be positive and to see some openings in that and I do believe that and that's when I meet uh, politicians from the EU or representatives of the universities inside the EU and they ask me like okay we understand the brain drain problem what do we do about that and I always suggest that do some sort of dual degree programs, you know, do some partnerships with the Ukrainian universities where the student would be a student both in university in Kyiv and in Wroclaw or Krakow or whatever else, Polish city or German or whatever. Uh, but then they would still have some institutional connection to the Ukrainian institution. Uh, that's, that's one, but also two, I think that all those partnerships uh, they will actually create uh, you know, incentives for the Ukrainian institutions to involve in, in dialogues with their Western counterparts and, and actually you know, get some improvement, like think about what is our curriculum? How can we, can we make it better? Now, if it's a dual program, we have to coordinate it. And you know, I guess maybe it's the case here, I'm not sure, but at least in Ukraine, often in the curriculum, there are some courses which are being taught just because there is a professor who needs to have teaching hours and, you know, but maybe it's time to reconsider that. We are really, it's, you know, thin on resources. We really should be focusing on that that makes the difference in terms of quality of education. 
so I do think that, um, yeah, again, this is a great opening. And if you ask me like, uh, yeah, what I'm arguing for, and, and I think the EU is starting to understand that the best option to proceed is, is support some types of partnerships between Ukraine and, and European universities or American for that matter. Uh, because uh, uh, yeah, I think that is the best way to proceed. Yeah, well, getting back to the, uh, the EU and membership in the EU, which seems to hang in the, in the background right now with all of this uh, going on, uh, then you're a part of the European research area, you're part of the European higher ed area, you have all these inter potential resources and things. So do you think, I, I just imagine in rebuilding um, a higher education system with some reforms, that that's going to be really a crucial component of doing that. But uh, what do you think? Yeah, indeed. And and I do have a great hope for that. I was uh, actually, again, meeting with many people in Brussels talking about that. Uh, uh, but the problem, of course, would be time, right? Because we'll need lots of money very soon, right? Uh, like we need lots of money for Chernihiv right now because half of the, you know, building, university buildings are destroyed. We cannot wait for the EU bureaucracy to, to step in because that can take some time sometimes. Um, but uh, overall, that is... Uh, yeah, I think that is the way forward. And and I'm, I've always been very much in favor of, of uh, Ukrainian higher education moving closer to the West. And I think now, uh, you know, not always uh, everybody inside Ukraine with the higher education have been agreeing with me, but I think now it's actually like 99% of people do understand it. The issue would be uh, with this um, is that most of Ukrainian academics don't speak English. And that's the sad fact. Mm that we have to recognize. I think about 20% of people would have a working level of English, but rest of them mm. were actually, up until very recently, very much orienting towards Russian academic world. They would still publish in Russia. They would, you know, because everybody at least understands Russian. And, uh, uh, and I think that right now is a good time to break those connections. It's good politically, you know, for obvious reasons, but it's also good academically because have you seen any big research taking place in Russia right now? Can there be good research in social sciences in, in Russia, which is an authoritarian regime? You know, so, so it's just bad quality research, you know? So, so if Ukrainian academia stays connected to that uh, research area, it stays connected to bad research area, right? So I think that um, there is great opportunities here. The question is how to use them and uh, how can we ask our, uh, professors who are, you know, very in in very difficult circumstances right now, also to take on another effort and learn English. Yeah, no, big challenge, absolutely. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, what are American universities doing, and what could they do to support uh, Ukrainian universities and academic community? And I'll only note, you know, we do have NGOs like uh, Scholars at Risk and there are kind of scholarship programs, uh, faculty in exile, academics in exile, these kinds of structures. So that's ongoing. Uh, but what about, what are other things that we might be doing in the United States? Yeah, uh, indeed, there are like scholars at risk, but they are again targeting those who left Ukraine. And I just want to refocus the attention of everyone that uh, who needs more support are actually those who stayed in Ukraine, including scholars, including professors. And, and uh, there is one initiative uh, that uh, we have been talking a lot uh, with Igor over here, who helped to organize my trip all together. Uh, we are very much supportive of this. It's a small initiative. Uh, it started here at Berkeley and University of Illinois. And they're just given a, a small stipend uh, as part of the non-residential fellowship for individual Ukrainian professors who are still inside Ukraine. And it's, uh, it's, it's, it's not a lot of money. And, uh, you know, many departments can just say like, okay, we are economics department. We can select one professor. $5,000 is, is not a lot of money for, for economics department of American University, but they can use it as a way to support individual scholars financially, which is very important now, but then also as the way to build connections, to meet new people, to, you know, to, to, to build those partnerships for the future. So, so that's one option. The second option um, is, uh, and, and it, it's not so much as a way to help Ukrainian universities, but, but I still have to mention this, that um, the studies of Ukraine research related to Ukraine is extremely limited in the United States. 
There is Harvard Ukrainian Research Institute, which is probably the biggest one that deals with the Ukraine. Uh, but other than that, typically Ukraine kind of falls, uh, you know, yeah, like there is a hole in, 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 in research because on the one hand, there is Eastern Europe that, that ends on the Western border of Ukraine with Poland and, you know, other countries. And then there are Russia studies. And as you all know, Ukraine is not Russia very much so 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 that is uh, and 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 then and then ukraine is kind of in in limbo and there is not lots of research efforts dedicated to that uh, and i think because of that uh, it's kind of you know students in the united states uh, universities are not introduced to ukraine they don't understand ukraine they never learned anything about it and there are not lots of opening not so lots of debates about that so so that's the thing number two and i think the thing number three again that we have been discussing is uh uh, Ukraine will need to rebuild itself, and and my big idea, and you know, Ukraine's whole big idea, is that we don't want to rebuild the institution that we had before. We want to build new and better ones. But in order to do that, we do need some, you know, uh, some ideas coming up from the outside, uh, and that is again where Berkeley and other great institutions you have over here can can serve as the platform, like uh, something we were discussing with John over here. He said, because uh, I just mentioned that, you know, we have 700,000 people in active war, war zone right now. So that will be at least 700,000 uh, veterans in the future. What do you do with this number of veterans? Um, and of course, the United States have a great example of the GI Bill and how you reintegrated the veterans into, the, uh, into your society. That is the experience we can learn from. So we can establish some sort of, you know, even discussion platforms, conferences, all of that, where where you can share your experience uh, in in in, you know, it can be you know long time experience, but still, you know, it will introduce some new ideas into Ukrainian academia, but also the society. Um, and then, of course, there are other initiatives like that. Uh, uh, there is a Ukrainian economist here at Berkeley, Yuri Horodnichenko, um, and uh, he's been doing uh, some research on Ukraine's recovery. And that's also important because, truth be told, we don't have the capacity to do that back home. Like, our institutions are strained. They, they hardly survive. They don't have capacity to do that. So that is something where, again, you can help with the you know, intellectual input, so to speak. Yeah, there's this Ukrainian network throughout the world that is really united to help Ukraine. And that's brought a lot of expertise from yeah. universities and elsewhere, I presume, yeah. uh, to uh, maintaining. I know that Yuri has uh, written about <clears throat> just maintaining, you know, uh, trying to control inflation, have uh, credit and being able to receive uh, funding and uh, working, you know, obviously developing de debts, but somehow making it a working in a com economy in the midst of war. It's truly a, an amazing uh, uh, feat. Let me just switch a little bit to uh, what's going on now. Um, and, you know, Ukraine has had a large number of international students yeah. over time. I think it's 75,000 yeah. students or so. I think that's a pre-war number, but I'm not absolutely sure. I presume it is. Um, so why were students coming to Ukraine? Ukraine, is it part of the old Soviet kind of network? And then how are you dealing with uh, international students? So we hear certain news stories about North African students and these kinds of things, but well, how do you deal with that? Yeah, um, yeah, indeed, Ukraine did have quite a big uh, foreign students population. Uh, Seventy-five thousand is about the, the the right number, actually. Um, about half of those students were medical students. That they would typically study medicine, um, and they would typically come from several um, regions. Um, India. We we had lots of students from India. We have lots of students from uh, from African countries. Uh, we had uh, a significant portion of students from China, and then we also had uh, uh, some students from uh, former Soviet republics uh, on the east. Uh, um, so, so those are the, those were the major groups of foreign students coming to study to Ukraine. Um, Again, half of them were medical students. They would go there to study medicine because uh, uh, it, it's just cheaper than inside the EU much cheaper. 
and the quality is, is relatively good. I wouldn't say it's perfect. I have lots of you know comments <laughs> uh, on how to improve it, and I actually worked separately a lot on, on medical education specifically. But but they still are quite satisfied. They typically go back to their to their home countries and and work as as doctors or any other professionals uh, back home. And uh, uh, of course, when the war started, uh, the big war started, uh, uh, they all they were one of the first to be evacuated. And uh, uh, yeah, the, the stories that were circulating, truth be told, slightly speculative because there were, you know, uh, people were saying like, "Oh, Ukrainians are racists uh, because they didn't help them enough or something." But the reality is that uh, because what they were complaining about, for those who have not seen those stories, is that mm -hmm. there were big lines and they were not allowed to be the first to, to leave, uh, basically. But but the, the border guards were saying the, the first to leave are, are the families with small kids. And and I'm sorry, but that sounds like like a reasonable argument to me. You know, there are kids who are crying and yelling and, and all of that. So 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 that was it was not about racism. It was about prioritizing different type of people, not grown ups, but but those with small kids. So 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 um, but, but because other than that, if you ask about experience of those uh, international students in Ukraine, they would not complain about racism in Ukraine. Ukraine is, you know, a rather open society and, and they didn't have much problem with that. So, um, but the problem now comes is that they are not coming back. That's for sure. That, I mean, for obvious reasons, again, we can't blame them. Yeah, were they an important component of the financing of uh, institutions? Or yeah, was it, yeah. You know... uh, particularly for medical universities. Uh, with medical universities, and that's a huge problem for them right now, uh, in some of those institutions, up to 70% of their annual budgets, to 70%. Would be coming from foreign students, so with them losing those students, they are just terrified. They are like they don't know what to do. They that it's like seventy percent of the budget. It's it's a lot. So so uh, yeah, that is uh, a big problem. I believe they will have to to shrink down somehow, which again would never be a popular thing to do in the university. Uh, but. Um, yeah, it is. It is the problem. Yeah, it's it's a huge problem. Uh, they did one thing, which I believe is stupid, uh, in terms of dealing with this problem, because uh, in Ukraine we have a, um, like in 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 many other post-Soviet countries, we have a system where, in order to get admitted to university, you take an exam, and if your grades are high enough, you study for free. But if if they're not good enough, you can still study as long as your parents are willing to pay tuition. And uh, uh, and the tuition is is not very high, literally. It's it's like I don't know, one hundred, two thousand dollars a year. So it's it's literally a majority of Ukrainian families would still be able to afford it. Um, mm -hmm. But the problem is actually not people being able to afford it. The problem was that universities were actually willing to take in anyone who is willing to pay. Uh, and and that's the problem for any field of study, but for medicine specifically. Uh, you know, if you take in people who are highly qualified to study in university, it's it, it's really bad idea to make them doctors. So um, that was uh, and 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 one of the things that I was involved in in terms of policy changes, introducing at least minimum requirements for for medical university students um, to to get access to education, and they 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 cancelled this this minimum requirement. Because they basically said, yeah, we are willing to take in anybody who is just willing to pay, to pay the money because we are so strained on resources, which I believe is the best bad adjustment strategy. Uh, I didn't support it because you know we'll end up with doctors who are half qualified to 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 treat patients. Yeah, but that was the adjustment mechanism for this year. But um, yeah, it's not really a good one. You know, remind me. I know that in Poland, uh, private uh, higher education has really been a significant component and usually for profit uh, for taking on students, uh, privates in uh, Ukraine, what's their status? And would they might have a role uh, if they were uh, properly accredited and regulated <laughs> in a post-war Ukraine? Oh, they are actually quite properly regulated. It's not, uh, it's, sorry, if I can say it, it's not like here. <laughs> it's, uh, it's actually maybe overly bureaucratic in our case. Uh, so, so, they, they, there are lots of bureaucratic procedures to ensure that they're doing like that they are meeting the minimum requirements. To what extent this bureaucracy helps determine the quality? That's a different question. But it's the same both for public and private. It, it's the same level of regulation they, that they all have to meet. It's it's no difference. 
Uh, the private sector, however, is, is relatively small. Mm -hmm. There are two significant private institutions that, they, that, that, that are still relatively small, but they're uh, big in terms of their inf impact on the whole system, which is Kiev School of Economics and Kiev, uh, the way I'm teaching, actually, uh, and uh, uh, Ukrainian Catholic University in Lviv. Um, and, and, and those are private institutions, uh, but they are, they are non-profit, uh, uh, but they are... Um, uh, they're big in terms of because they're introducing new ideas and new approaches to education and, and many public institutions said to look at them because, you know, it's often easier to build something from scratch than to reform what uh, what existed before. And I think that those two institutions and Kiev Mohila Academy, which is a public institution, but but was recreated in 1991, uh, is, are the three biggest in terms of impact, in terms of change in the, the higher education scene in Ukraine. Um, but, uh, but but the reason why there is no big room for private sector in, in Ukraine's higher education is uh, because, as I mentioned, uh, I probably didn't mention that, because of demographics, our student population is shrinking. It used to be about 2 million some 15 years ago. It's about 1 million right now. And it's, it's pure demographics. It's because th there were less kids born 18 years ago than, than before. Uh, and because of that, uh, students, uh, uh, but the universities never shrank, shrank, is that the right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, they, they never shrank. So, so the universities are still big and they actually have more places than there are high school graduates in mm. public institutions. So and public institutions, apart from those two big two key school of economics and Catholic university, public institutions are typically more prestigious. So there is basically a spot for almost anyone. And about 80% of Ukrainian high school graduates go to university, which can sound like a good idea. The truth is that it also means that we're taking half qualified students who are not prepared. And, and I'm seeing that with my teaching, even in, in best institutions in the country, the quality of, of, uh, of students is, is declining. So um, yeah, so private sector is there. It's not big in terms of numbers. Again, two institutions which are big in terms of impact. Let me ask a question that I think I might know the answer to. And uh, while I do that, I don't know if Igor, after this, you have a question from the, no, okay, I'll go to the audience if there's one, not quite yet. Uh, so um, I've had discussions with colleagues in the European Union uh, about this, but what do you think the approach should be towards Russian universities? Uh, for example, you know, the initial, uh, with the invasion, thousands of academics wrote letters of protest, some from the um, academies, some from the universities, and some of those have then become victims of, of Putin's uh, uh, crackdown. Uh, but there's kind of a sense, I think, in the European Union that, uh, and uh, the Ukrainian approach is that, you know, there should be no relationships, uh, uh, no relationships with Horizon program or other these kinds of things. But uh, it's hard to tell what is the right approach. Uh, is there a kind of, I kind of look at it as a initial cold, cold period, and then depending on the fate of what happens, how to rebuild those relationships. But what's your view? Uh, should we just be closing all relationships with all Russian academics, not just the universities, which universities are often, you know, aligned with Putin or chosen by Putin, the rectors and these kinds of things. Yeah. Um, can Igor take that question? <laughs> um, yeah. Um, well, I, I don't pretend to be unbiased here, right? Like, no pretense of that. Uh, and I clearly have a conflict of interest. But I'm, uh, if I'm trying to be as unbiased as possible, uh, the reality is that indeed, uh, like with 80% or more, you know, uh, of people of Russia supporting this war, even after they learned about Bucha and Irpin and Mariupol and all of that, that also includes 80% of university professors and university students. There were indeed some letters by, by professors saying that they are against this war, but then there were also thousands of letters saying that we support this war by university rectors. There was actually a big letter circulated with, I don't remember how many hundreds of, of university rectors signing up on that, saying that they are supporting this war. You see, there were videos of, of students. I remember one from uh, students from uh, Moscow International Relations Institute uh, 
and they recorded this this very you know soviet style <clears throat> video where they're all like like nice with their ties and all of that saying that they are supporting russia's interests and they want this war to you know to be victorious for russia and they want to destroy ukraine and all of that so so um i don't think people here will probably realize to what extent this the whole russian society is 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 what is the right way to say infected okay with with this virus of of hatred and uh it's it's like nazi society in germany in the world war ii it's uh you know i'm reading the comments on, on russian social media with thousands of similar comments saying like i want ukrainian kids to be starving and to be dying i want I'm, I'm fine with my my husband who is a soldier in russia raping ukrainian women because that is what they deserve uh, and 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 so and 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 part of that is is really that there is no differentiation between you know non-university and university people that's as scary as it is uh, are there some individual scholars who are not supporting this yeah of course but in terms of cooperation with institution it's it's unacceptable at this point until they change because then they don't feel any pressure to change then they feel that you know yeah it's you know things can be happening we can still have a, a chance to go to paris for conference you know that they shouldn't be having this chance just because well for once they they represent the state that says that they hate everything that paris stands for but uh, you know because it's actually a very dubious mentality where they say that on the one hand they they hate the west that that's the official you know ideology of the russian state uh, but they also kind of like going shopping to to milan and and you know taking part in conferences in stockholm and all of that well if they hate the west so much then you know that should be noted. Uh, so I don't think there is a way for cooperation right now, um, because that, you know, some sort of behavior should be punished. There should be some sort of collective responsibility, no matter how wrong it can sound. But we are bearing collective responsibility for, for, for this. My son goes to bomb shelter three times a day. You know, did he do something wrong to deserve this? No, but, but this is part of the situation right now. So, uh, but then also I think that, uh, that no cooperation with the Russian institution at this point will actually create internal pressure inside Russia. They will be seeking for this cooperation after all. And, and, and well, they need to realize that the way to do it is to change uh, the regime inside Russia. Okay, so a few questions uh, here first. Uh, please, short questions, short okay. questions. Speaking of Nazis, um, some years ago, um, the Ukrainian universities accepted uh, the Nazi Klansman David Duke as a student, and I'm wondering what is what's the quality of education in Ukraine that accepts someone like that who writes revisionist Holocaust a uh, uh, revisionist uh, Holocaust doctoral thesis, and are the, the the same kind of faculty still there today? Oh, it. Uh... I don't know about this specific case. I'm sorry. Uh, I don't. Uh, David Duke but, is the most notorious Nazi in America. Uh, did they accept accepted, him as. as accepted and did a doctoral thesis in a Ukrainian university. Did you know which university it was? Okay, I'll have to double check on that. But uh, uh, I'll tell you this. Uh, in Ukrainian parliament, we don't have a single uh, radical uh political party represented not to say like like there was one which would we call a uh, radical right party it had about uh, 1.8 percent of support during elections so anyone claiming that there are nazis in ukraine well there are nazis uh, in other countries but trust me ukrainian society is, is extremely unradical in its nature altogether um uh, I will. I will have. I will just have to double check which university it was. Sorry, it, I think I know which one it was. I'm okay. sorry. Okay, that's uh, so. A short question. Please say who you are or who you're affiliated with, and then we'll go to Igor after that, and then back because Igor has something from the from the. Okay. Fine. Uh, hi, my name is Nina. I'm originally from Ukraine. I'm an ex professor of finance. Uh, currently enjoying um, exploring my other life passions. <laughs> Um, so I have a question slash a suggestion what could, on what could be done to help students in uh, Ukraine. So I have a friend who is a professor 
in Milan and who is also at the same time teaching at Donetsk University. And uh, she this year has established an one-on-one -on -one peer um, once a week conversations between uh, her students in Milan and in at Donetsk University. So um, volunteer students um, in Milan who wanted to once a week chat with Ukrainian students and volunteering students in, in uh, at Donetsk University. So this way they were chatting just once a week and uh, exchanging information about the war, what's happening, so informa infor was informative for uh, students in Milan, but for Ukrainian students was a feel of support, practice of English, also maybe inspiration from the foreign curriculum. So I was wondering how difficult it would be to establish something like this on the national level, like to, um, for so that most of students who are at different Ukrainian universities has one-on-one -on -one conversations once a week uh, with volunteers from different universities from all over the world, uh, those which are interested in, of course. Um, thank you, Nina. Uh, sorry, I double check on David Duke. Uh, so he got into uh, Maup, uh, which is a crazy university. Like literally, it's, it's, uh, it's a private institution which has been, uh, uh, yeah, it has very bad reputation in Ukraine. Uh, and I think they're shutting it down. Yeah, yeah, it's it's like literally, it's because uh, I sorry, I just had to double check it. But Maup is is uh, it has been infamous for for multiple uh, like violations of all possible rules and all of that. It so it's it's not uh, a typical because it sounded strange to me. But if it's Maup, it's it's like yeah, it's uh, yeah. But there are different institutions which are you know uh, shambles in in other uh, countries as well. This is one of them. So it's not a well established Ukrainian university at all. So. Question back there. Oh, oh, sorry. Should I comment? I should comment on what Nina said. Uh, this oh, sorry, this sorry. idea does make sense. I don't believe it can be done nationwide. I think there needs to be just initiatives from universities. Let's say Berkeley says we can do this for uh, students, and and they have connections with the uh, other universities, and uh, we can spread information about this as a model. But I don't see uh, it's going to be overly difficult to coordinate it on the national level. But uh, initiatives from the bottom up, bottom up, are actually making sense, and uh, uh, we can think about how to promote this this model of, of uh, you know getting in touch with different people. Hi, thanks, Anna, for this talk. Um, my name is Talani Britton. I'm an assistant professor at the Berkeley School of Education. I was really struck when you said that 80% of students um, were attending, 80% of high school graduates are attending university. I have two questions, um, both pretty short. One is this seems like an op, I wanna first acknowledge the challenges of having 80% attend, but also thinking about the opportunities. Um, if we're thinking about a society where 80% of people are getting to and potentially through college, I would imagine that particularly for a society that's being rebuilt, that's an opportunity. Um, so I was wondering if you could comment on one, whether or not you sort of see an opportunity there, and two, what might be some of the ways that the university may have to sort of pivot or change in order to serve those students and essentially, you know, help them to graduate so that they can then contribute to the economy? Um, thanks for, for the question. Um, so, uh, again, I understand how it can look like a great idea, right? 80% of, of, uh, of young people going through, through university. Uh, does sound like like you know it's great right but the problem is because it becomes like access to university becomes basically uncompetitive people don't really have to make an effort as long as their parents have like one thousand dollars a year and willing to pay the tuition then th they don't need to make an effort and what I'm seeing and I'm, I'm hearing that from from other professors as well is that students are just getting lazy I, I, it sounds bad, but with students who did not, they didn't have to, you know, to fight to get access to the university. They didn't have to make an effort. Uh, and of course, they, they did have to make a minimum effort, but but still, like, they're not getting used to working hard. And even with my students in Kiev Mohila, who are like, they actually, the, the, the access to Kiev Mohila is very competitive. It's, it's like one in 20 people getting in. But even among those students, about one third, are not ready to work really hard to get through the through through the course, and then when I when I say that you know you are failing the course, I can't I can't do anything like because you don't do your homework, you don't read or you don't you know take your task seriously, 
they're genuinely surprised because when when they don't have to you know to make an effort to get into the university then they also feel like going through university would not require an effort as well and then they just they expect a diploma in four years without making too much of an effort and this is a problem you know how i mean i'm all in favor of, of more people getting getting higher education it's, it's, it's a great idea but the question is to what extent that is actually benefiting them or to what extent that is actually just showing them that you know they can basically get a diploma as soon as they you know uh, get access to university which is very very easy in ukraine so this is the problem and that is where universities need to realize that their um, their job is not just to you know to grant a diploma after four years but actually to give education uh, and that is becoming challenging uh, because some universities, and here I get back to, to the issue I discussed, corruption. You know, why make an effort if you can pay a bribe? And, and uh, get, I mean, it's not with all universities, but in some universities it still exists, right? Uh, or you can, uh, I, I've had students who would come over to me and say, but can you please, please, please uh, put me a C so that I don't fail and go, you know, further with my studies? And they're just begging. I know professors are just terrified of these students who just come and beg for just just put me a good grade so that I can go further with my education. Uh, it's became like a huge wave. I think that is uh, uh, that is a problem. So so I think the problem is how to make sure that with a you know quite a extensive access to higher education is actually access not to diplomas, but to actual education. And that is a bit more problematic, like very problematic, truth be told. I know that some students, they just expect diplomas and that's all. Yeah, this is like, uh, again, going back to the theme of out of this tragedy, but maybe a significant opportunity to change higher education in, in Ukraine to match more the societal needs, the labor market, these kinds of things. Uh, so it's going to be uh, we hope a tremendous opportunity. Of course, the question is how long this war is going to go on. And I know in that previous discussion, that was, if you're interested, a really great uh, discussion uh, that Hina had with uh, 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 Janet Napolitano and others uh, on Tuesday, which is online through GSPP, I believe, uh, just talking about, well, what is the end of the war going to look like? And um, basically, I think we could say is the only way the war is going to end is if Putin ends in his leadership position. At least that's the current kind of thinking that one can't have a deal made with uh, somebody who uh, can't keep international treaties and um, is so aggressive. But uh, so we're going to go to a final question that Igor has from our, um, our internet uh, world. Yeah, this is uh, for, from the live stream. And this is actually, there are two questions, but they're somehow interrelated and they're very close to my heart because I study student experience. So first one, what kind of skills or knowledge have been prioritized for university students during the war? And the second one, again, I think it's related. What is the perception of Ukrainian university students towards their education amid the war and how much efforts do they devote to learning considering the limitations and struggles? Oh, uh, so in answering the first question, I think uh, that, um, well, in addition to what students would typically be learning, uh, they are now, uh, th there are more courses, but they're typically in formal education, not so much through university, but then universities often serve as the, the venue for this. Is, is different courses on tactical medicine, on uh, civilian defense, uh, and, and, and I don't know, people learning how to shoot, which is, which is, Ukraine is not a big country with big gun ownership, actually. It has never been a big part of the culture altogether. And now I'm seeing like my, my students uh, are learning how to shoot. And, and uh, that shooting they're not doing in universities, luckily. But, but tactical medicine is something that uh, many universities are organizing these sort of courses uh, uh, for their students and stuff. Uh, um, and and um, other type of, uh, of, of training that is, uh, you know, related to how to survive uh, uh, during the war. Um, so I think that is uh, what has been um, yeah, gaining more prominence. And there is also discussion that this should actually be part of the obligatory curriculum in high school uh, because we do have some course some discipline called civilian defense which was pretty useless and, and nobody knew what to do with us course but now more and more schools 
I actually choose and like, yeah, we should really learn tactical medicine because that became like, everybody knows at least something about tactical medicine right now, what to do in case of you are seeing a person bleeding and so on. Um, and then uh, um, in terms of uh, your second question, that, that's a very good one because of course, on the one hand, okay, I'll tell you this. I had this experience myself as uh, I was teaching in the summer. Um, I teach two courses in two universities. And in Kiev Mohila, I get to, like a week before I was to start a course, I'm getting an email from a student. And he says, um, uh, Professor Sofsun, uh, I am, uh, I was signed, I, I signed up for your course. It's not an obligatory course, it's they, they sign up for the course. Uh, but I'm currently serving in the army. Uh, can you please put me a C? And, and, and I will just pretend like I took the course so that I can get to the next year of studies. It's like, it's like that he has to have a certain number of credits to get transferred to another year of studies. And, and that was a huge ethical challenge for me. Like, what do you do in this situation? How do you react to that? It's, uh, um, and and I, I took two days to think about it. Because on the one hand, I, I very much appreciate what he's doing right now, serving in the army, protecting all of us. But on the other hand, what are we fighting for, if not for the better future? Of the whole country, uh, what if, and we cannot get to that better future with you know students you know uh, failing their education. So I actually wrote back and said I can't do it. I'm very sorry, but um, just uh, you'll have to come up with another plan. But I cannot do it because that will compromise everything that we are fighting for. Um, I don't know how he took it. I don't know what other professors responded as well. I, I didn't ask. But um, it's a big challenge, right? What do you do? To what extent you, or there are other situations, uh, students who have been relocated, students uh, who had uh, one of their parents killed uh, in, in the war. Like how much can you ask of them uh, during this war? Uh, and, and this is ethically very challenging, very challenging situation. But I do think, and that is what I was telling my students at the start of the course, I was saying, I understand we're all in extremely difficult circumstances, me, you, all of us, right? But we have to make the most out of this experience. And uh, we would not, like, all this war is worth nothing if at the end we will get half-educated society. So uh, I said that I'm not lowering my demands for passing the course, but I don't think that is what 100% of professors did. I think many people say, yeah, you know, I feel sorry for the students and so on and so forth. And uh, I don't know what is the right thing to do. I just said what my individual approach was. But overall, that is a big challenge, uh, like um, how to do this. And another big challenge is also uh, how to deal with students in particularly difficult circumstances and to what extent um, universities can help them. Because... Uh, I mean, everybody is traumatized, but I had a, a case, uh, a, a one student, uh, and that was on the ethics in public sphere course. And we were discussing um, the, the ethical challenges during wartime. And, and, and it was online, uh, well, it was, it was online. And one student just suddenly disappeared from the classroom, online classroom. And then like hour after the class was over, he wrote me an email and he said, I'm sorry, I just logged out but I just felt overwhelmed and I started crying. Uh, and it was a, a male student, so that's very untypical. Uh, he said, I just I just got overwhelmed and, and I couldn't do it anymore. Can I do some written assignment instead so that I get my grades and all of that? Uh, like, how do you do, deal with that? Me as a professor, I don't have the capacity to do that. I also don't know what is the right thing to do. I'm not a psychologist or anything, you know? Uh, so I think that is also one of the things that universities should learn how to help students in those particular difficult situations or who just feel overwhelmed for some reason, like we all do. Um, that's a big challenge as well. Well, Anna Sobson, thank you so much. It's been a real pleasure to have you and an honor that you came back. I just want to note that it does seem that we should end on a slightly hopeful note. And that is, again, what might emerge uh, from Ukraine after this terrible war. And you think of universities as really being uh, potentially a really important component uh, on the research side, on issues such as water quality and 
roads and buildings and transportations and finance and uh, uh, meeting labor market needs. Universities can play a really important component of that. And I think finally that we really see uh, in, you know, we occasionally see this, but a real uniting, united uh, effort or at least concern by the international higher education community to help Ukraine in the future. So with that, let's uh, give a round of applause to our guest. And thank you so much.